I seriously can't believe I haven't reviewed one of these things yet. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. Today we're talking about Gibson's first try in 1980 to reissue the 59 Les Paul. Spoiler alert, they did an awful job as compared to modern day historics. And you could argue that the Les Paul KM came before this model, and that was a fail of a reissue also. You can check out this episode here. So perhaps it's best to say this is Gibson Nashville's first attempt at a big batch run of 59 reissues. Oh, and just a quick update on the prototype that Gibson has on their website. I talked with Randy Leonard, and that one was actually in his books. That one was created in October of 1982, so it is confirmed that was just a prototype to one of those small run pre-pre-prehistoric reissues. So the hunt still continues for the true heritage prototype, but let's go ahead and check this one out. Because Randy taught me something I didn't realize about these models. But first, let's start with the case. Gibson tried to reissue the Lifton style cases. And while the outside Tolex isn't exactly the same, it definitely has a certain vibe to it. And there's actually a few different versions to this case. They were changing it all the time. I don't think I've actually seen one with these vintage style latches on it before. But let's take a look at this guitar to learn a little bit more about them. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I found this thing on Reverb. And I've been looking for a good Heritage 80 standard to review and document and hopefully add to my collection. Because this is the version that is the most desirable to most people on the used and vintage market. The reason for that being is this is the one that has the closest specs to a true 1959 reissue. So, where did they go wrong on the Heritage series? We do not have the ABR-1 bridge. We didn't get that till the prehistoric era. We do not have a long neck tenon under here. We didn't get that until 1993 in the custom shop when that finally opened. We did get a slightly thinner headstock as compared to the standards of the era, but it's not quite the exact same shape. And in fact, the body is actually a little bit smaller on these. It's like a quarter inch shorter. We'll take a dimension on the workbench. And they got these really doofy pointy horns to them, which is something you'll probably never notice unless you compare it side by side to a regular or less Paul and then your eye just never unsees it. And then for these standards, they got these strange three-piece mahogany necks. Like, that's not a 59 spec at all. Keep in mind, these were birthed during the era where Gibson was using maple necks exclusively on Les Paul models. And they had these big honking volutes on the back. So the fact that this has no volute and some sort of a mahogany neck was a step in the right direction at the time. But a little bit more on that here in a second. We do not have an ink stamp serial number. It's just your regular one and you've got the Made in USA. Grover tuners are a more modernized thing. So it might sound like I'm being hard on these things, but what did they get right? What makes this different from a regular Les Paul standard of the era? We have the return of a two-piece figured maple top. This was still birthed within the era where three pieces was the most common. That doesn't mean you don't find other two-piecers or one-piecers, but this was a standard spec across all of these models. We have the introduction of the now fabled Tim Shaw PAF pickups. That's right, I'm pretty sure this is the first series to feature those, because most Les Paul Customs didn't start to get them until like early 1981-ish. This is also around the time when we start to see these new reissue style knobs. They are my favorite knobs ever created. It's what you'll find on a lot of the prehistorics and like spotlight specials. We no longer have pancake construction. However, most of that had been phased out pretty much by this point, although many guitars still had that pancake layer hiding underneath your maple top. But overall, these things are just beautiful. And at that point in time, you didn't really have much that was brand new that looked kind of like a 59. The initial run of these lasted from 1980 till about 1982 and were developed based on the success that some dealers were having by having Gibson make them custom 59 spec guitars, such as the strings and things, Les Paul. And just the hype of the original 50s Les Pauls and early 60s starting to become a big thing. And all these models were indicated on the truss rod cover. So right here you can see Heritage Series Standard 80. And all of these had a limited edition serial number on the back, on top of our serial number in Made in USA. You'll find these with flame tops, that doesn't mean you won't find a quilty one here and there. Typically you'll find some sort of a cherry sunburst and or honey burst like color, but there are a few rare gold top models out there. On the used market, they're a little bit less desirable, because when you can find tops like these, most buyers would prefer that. And in fact, I've actually seen a couple ebony versions as well, so it's something to keep an eye out for if you're a collector. But the three-piece neck is a specific spec to this version, and these got a rosewood fretboard. But your next one was the Heritage Series Standard 80 Elite. What changed here is you get an ebony fretboard for some reason. I don't know why, and then this is what Randy taught me. All the Elites should have a one-piece mahogany neck. 
I had never realized that before today. I thought it was just random chance, but apparently that is another difference in spec here. Now you might notice that this one has a red back. Is that something else that the elites got? No, that's color specific. It looks like most of the heritage cherry sunburst finished ones got the more historically correct red back like the original bursts did. But you can find that on both standard and elite, depending on your finish type. Now the Elite initially had pickup covers on it, but this is just a particularly cool quilty example. And a lot of the Elites will have the quilt tops, but again, sometimes that varies. So the Elite's kind of strange. We, we get the technically better neck, but you get the strange fretboard choice, but it's kind of cool in a weird quirky way. And then there was a third one. It's called the Heritage Award. There were approximately 50 of those. I've seen a serial number as high as 53, but they got a cool mother of pearl plaque at the back and they came stock with, instead of Nick hardware, gold hardware, and those were awarded to dealers who had exceptional sales. Otherwise, they're pretty much specced out exactly like an 80 Elite with the one-piece neck and the ebony fretboard, as far as the ones I've seen. If anybody's selling one at a reasonable price, feel free to reach out. So if you're trying to choose between a modern day reissue or an 80s reissue, if you care about 59 correct specs, you're going to want to go for the modern thing. But these things have their own pros and cons. But if you really want that ABR1 bridge and you have to have an 80s Les Paul, go for a prehistoric starting in 1983. So at the end of the day, are these the best 59 reissues ever made? No, but they have a certain charm to them because they were the first mass produced run of Gibson trying to do this. They birthed and paved the way for so many other models. These these things walked so the prehistorics and later custom shops could run. And that's why, you know, they got a pretty cool quirky vintage aesthetic to them. As far as the story on this one, this was a one owner guitar up in Canada. I saw it listed on Reverb. It was in respectable condition. Like it's got a couple of dings on the neck, kind of a more major one right here, but this was very well respected and cared for throughout its whole life. We've got a couple of nicks and dings we'll see over here on the workbench. But let's go ahead and throw this standard 80 up on there to take a nitty gritty look at all the details. Okay, let's start with the best part, the Tim Shaw PAFs. I love first year examples. They just have such a vibe to them. So the way you read Tim Shaw PAF date stamps, they'll all have like a 137 or a 138 or something similar. I believe that's how you tell neck from bridge. However, I don't think it really matters. What you're most interested in is your last four or three digits. So this tells you it's December. It's the 12th month of the year. And then this tells you the year, 1980. So if you come over here and you go, hey, why does this one have a space? And why do most of the ones I see have a space, but not all of them have a space? It's because one stands for January. You only have October, November, December that'll have the double digits. So if you're ever confused looking at a date stamp of a Tim Shaw PAF pickup, that's probably what's throwing you off. So January 1981 and December of 1980. But something about the stylization of that zero, it does it for me. It looks good because <laughs> that's the only year that you'll ever see that. Whereas all the other numbers get used in some sense. As far as readings within the circuit, generally Tim Shaw's are around 7.2 to 7.5 ish. So we got 7.27 in the bridge, 7.43 in the neck, not uncommon, and 3.67 in the middle just for fun. Here's our neck pickup cavity. As I was telling you earlier, these are still short neck tenons. They haven't yet introduced the long neck construction. We've got some sort of a marking in there, but I can't really tell what it says. Probably a color code. However, our bridge pickup's a little bit more fun. It says dot number six, and then L22, and then we have a stamped six, or nine, I guess. But here's a good area to see your maple top joining onto the mahogany body. Now let's take a look at our Nashville style bridge. So unfortunately, our stud is actually loose in this one, but being a Nashville style bridge, it does have that inside the body, and then the post goes into that. So that makes it non-historic. The ABR1 bridge doesn't have that part. It's just drilled directly into the top. Now, could you pull the stud like that, fill it in and put a regular ABR1 in? Yeah, or you can do one of those Faber upgrades. But the bridge itself is nickel, and it's just like all the other ones of the era. They were made by Schaller in Germany. Here's another spec they got wrong. It's full weight tailpiece, not lightweight aluminum. That one's not too big of a deal though. You could easily swap that out if you wanted to historicify this thing. But we have two volumes, one for each pickup and two tones. Same thing going on there. Again, awesome UFO style knobs. They're my favorite knobs Gibson has ever used. Here's a quick look at that pick guard. Take a look underneath this pick guard. It's kind of cool. He got a little bit of a eye in the wood grain. And it looks like our pick guard has left an impression on the top, but you kind of expect that. And this one is not mint condition. Looks like somebody's pick really kind of 
impress the finish a bit right there. But after a light cleaning, some of those small blemishes just went away. I don't know about you guys, but I just love these like honey burst iced tea like finishes. That's why you buy one of these Heritage 80s is they just have a really cool look to them. And being from 1980, knowing that it was Gibson's first attempt makes them pretty cool. But we got to give credit where credit's due. Something that I don't necessarily talk about too often is they changed the top car for these Heritage guitars. Because after the Heritage series, you can also find a candy apple red standard that gets the Heritage top carve. You've got a nice deep dish carve right here, whereas most Les Paul standards of this era, and customs for that matter, they're pretty flat pancakes. If you're more of a visual learner, here it is on the contour gauge. You see how it dips down and then curves all the way up? I took this measurement from here to there. And for comparison, yeah, I wasn't kidding. They're flat pancakes. I mean, it's got a little bit of a carve, but then towards the middle, it just really bumps up there. So here they are side by side. Yeah, you can tell there's a big difference. In fact, I would say that's one of the most important things that came out of the Heritage series, that Gibson relearned how to do the top carves. So moving on from that mahogany body and two-piece maple top, got our rosewood fretboard on our three-piece mahogany neck. And you got your cool celluloid inlays, which is correct. Now going up and down here, you can tell that this was not a case queen. It was actually played quite a bit. You've got lots of flattening fret wear. However, all that's easily level recrownable. But we've got 22 frets. I'm sure the fret wire might be a little bit different from regular. I never really get that accurate measurements out of this, but 0 0.053, if that helps anybody, with a width of about 0.1. Low and wide frets were in at the time, so I'm sure those are slightly taller. But we've got that 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length with a 12 inch fretboard radius. Her nut measures 1.7 inches and increases to 2.06 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.89 and 0.98 by the 12th, but you're starting to hit that heel. So 0.93 at the 10th gives you a better representation of this. It's more so like a 1960 neck profile. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. The shoulders really fall off quickly and then you're just kind of left with a center of a neck. Got a little bit of a flat spot too. And now that the contour gauge has pointed it out, yeah, you do feel that. Although it's not as apparent up on the higher registers of the neck, but definitely in your recording area. Moving on to our headstock, truss rod's looking to be in fine shape. We've got the Les Paul model silkscreen and our Gibson logo. I guess you could say that's wrong. It's not 50 spec, but it's definitely of the era. But our headstock did just get a little bit smaller. At the widest point, just a little over three inches. And you'll notice that these washers around the Grover tuners are obnoxiously big. Some people were asking about that on that prototype that we were talking about. Yeah, that is a thing that happened. Up here on the headstock, we got a couple of small dings, including one at the top corner, kind of a more extreme one on the other side, and one right there. I mainly document that because I'm scared in 20 years when I'm looking over my guitars, I'm going to see a ding and be like, uh oh, did I cause that or was it already on the guitar? <laughs> so these videos will help me remember. Moving on to the backside, it looks extra clean, but get it in the light, you can see quite a few light impressions just in the clear coat though, so it presents well. That's definitely the deepest ding on the back, but this definitely matches what the frets were showing us. But popping the control cavity up here made me smile. There it is. It's Randy's dad's signature, Floyd Leonard. So we got a star and a plus, which means it's an awesome top and it sounds great. Because Floyd was the guy who made sure all the guitars were working and did the sound test. But unfortunately, no Randy signature over here, so it's not a double take. But this one has definitely never been messed with from the factory. All the solder joints look perfect. And it's looking like the 10th week of 1980 for our pot codes. Seems consistent. And some mid-1979s. Yeah, they must have been using up some old stuff. The important thing to watch out for is that these two match and these two match because that's typically how they are in the early 80s. I say it a lot, but a lot of 1983 Gibsons will actually have 1980 pots up here and then 1983 down there. But we can see our output jack on the side. It's metal. It shouldn't be if we were going for 59 reissue. I guess if we're going to go into that, we shouldn't have the shielding and grounding tin over top of that. That's just what they were doing in this era. We do have kind of a deep scratch over here. Somebody couldn't find the output jack. Got our original strap button. Here's a quick peek at our toggle switch cavity. It's also got that metal shielding. But get this, we do have the thin binding in the cutaway, which is this if you don't know what I'm talking about. It just looks like a glue seepage layer, but no, that's the maple top being exposed. That's how they did it in the 50s. It looks like we got some gene riveting going on over here. But now let's measure this body. I get 17 inches long. 
And yeah, sure enough, here's another Les Paul. It measures 17 and a quarter inches. So Heritage Series guitars are a quarter inch smaller. I had somebody email me about that. So I definitely wanted to check that out because that's not something you're ever going to notice. But it might be because they thought they measured a real 59 and maybe it wasn't a real 59. And that's what they based the specs on. I don't know. That, that's just an absolute guess. We've got kind of an interesting chatoyne effect to the wood right here too. It almost looks like a scarf joint of some type, but it's not. It's just the three piece neck and it's dancing around. But we've got that ding right here and a few other minor ones. But another cool thing about this era of Gibson is they use this kind of creamy yellow grain fill. I think it kind of aged a little bit more extreme than maybe it looked brand new. I'm not entirely too sure. But many a times you can find very uneven coating of that. Like this neck almost looks modern because it didn't get the grain fill for whatever reason. But then as you go up here to the headstock, you can see where it did start taking and it just looks completely different. It's kind of interesting. I've come to appreciate it a lot the more and more I see it. But our serial number dates this one to the 14th day of 1981, Nashville production, 866 for the production number made in USA. And our limited edition serial number is 1614. Yeah, they made a lot of these guitars. But check out our vintage Grovers. I love these. They call them the milk bottle style because if you take this away and you take that away, you just kind of see the bottle and then the neck of it. Once you see it, you never unsee it. Gotta love these old Grovers. They work pretty good. Now the weights on these can be all over the place. This one is actually a really good weight at just a hair under nine pounds. So let's go ahead and plug this one in and hear how it sounds. neck pickup Tim Shaw PAFs. They just always have such a nice juiciness to them. The typical problem is that the neck pickup is way hotter than the bridge, so you have to kind of offset that. Otherwise, you'll find that the neck pickup is just way louder. Now let's kick on some dirt.
it's really fun coming back to one of these years later after I've experienced so many models. I think I'm finally starting to hear what people don't like about these New Orleans era 100 to 300 K pots. They, it really does sound slightly choked. So if you're looking for like some really highly modernized sounds, you might not like these as much and you might want to rewire them with 500 K CTS. However, if you're going for more of a vintage tone rather than more modern, heavier distortions, I think you might like that charm. I mean, these were specced out that way on purpose. But all said and done here, I hope this video helps you understand the Heritage 80 series that Gibson did in the early 80s. If you're looking for the most 59 historically specced guitar in the world, this is not it. But I hope you understand just how historically significant this model is for Gibson because it was their first time really, really trying to do a 59 reissue in a large batch scale. So if that appeals to you or the way these things look, definitely try one out. As far as this one, if you want to buy it from me, maybe, I I'm not sure. The more and more I look at it, the more there are gouges and dings everywhere, but it's relatively clean, all things considered. But I hope you enjoyed learning about this model. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.